Time for us to discuss telescopes a little bit on how astronomers gather the light that is so important to study. Uh, we can't go to stars or galaxies. Uh, we can barely go to the planets. So we gather light to learn about these objects. Now there's an inherent difficulty. Now, why is it dark at night? The stars don't deliver much light to the Earth. And you'd have a lot of trouble reading a book with uh, with no moon out and uh, far from city lights. It's just starlight does not uh, is not bright. <clears throat> so we have to gather light with an instrument. Our eyes do not let enough light in to uh, really give us a good viewing of the stars. We need to gather light with some tools. And we're going to talk about uh, types of telescopes in this video. Um, in some other videos will talk about the some calculations you can do to compare telescopes. And in another video, we'll talk a little bit about the Earth's atmosphere um, regarding blue sky and space telescopes. So the telescopes uh, have to deal with the Earth's atmosphere uh, for quite a long time. All the telescopes were on the Earth. But starting in the 1960s, uh, instruments could be put into space on satellites. The two basic types of telescopes, refractor and reflector. Refractors use lenses to gather the light. The reflector uses a mirror to gather the light. And radio telescopes, uh, we'll cover those. And as I say in future uh, video, light gathering power and uh, infrared and x-ray, some of the results. So there's atmosphere problem. We have here the colored band, Roy G. Biv. Uh, the visible light pretty much gets through our atmosphere. There's a little bit of absorption in our atmosphere. This chart, the deeper down the, uh, the line is, the more transparent is the atmosphere. Though the atmosphere is pretty transparent in the visible light, it's not transparent in ultraviolet or x-rays or gamma rays. And that's probably for the best. It protects us from those radiations. Uh, from events in space. Um, out in the infrared, there are certain wavelengths, especially out in uh, this part of the infrared, that if you're on a mountaintop, you can observe in the infrared with a telescope. Uh, but at sea level, it's pretty tough. That light gets absorbed. Um, another big chunk of the infrared spectrum that's not available to us. Then out in the radio region, our atmosphere is transparent to radio waves. Uh, if they're not too long of a wavelength. So there's a, a little survey of what we have to deal with, what astronomers have to deal with. Our atmosphere basically lets visible light and radio waves to the ground, a little bit of infrared. So we'll continue here. Telescopes uh, got a big push in astronomy with Galileo. Galileo did not invent the first telescope, and he probably didn't make the first astronomy observations. But he certainly did uh, publish his observations better than anyone else. So there's some books here and uh, Galileo's two surviving telescopes from uh, his work. And this is the Science Museum in Florence, Italy. Uh, it has great displays, not just this little display of Galileo's equipment, but uh, many, many astronomical instruments from uh, several hundred years ago. So. He, he built refracting type telescopes with a lens at each end that would give some magnification, but again, the main purpose was to gather light to see uh, dimmer objects. So the two types, refracting telescope, we use a lens to gather the light. So a star is out here perhaps, um, half of a star anyway. The light's coming into the tube of the telescope, and here's the objective. The objective gathers the light and sends that down to a focus. This would be the prime focus, but the image is not viewed there. Instead, the light continues on through an eyepiece that uh, produces kind of a parallel beam of light here that is comfortable for the eye to view. Um, so this is the construction of a refracting telescope. A lens gathers the light. Then the reflecting telescope uses a mirror so the light is coming in, hitting a mirror here, and this particular design is a schmidt cassegrain design, a schmidt cassegrain but the light is gathered by the main mirror. The light is reflected to a secondary mirror, 
and then back through a hole in the main mirror to an eyepiece that's back here. Uh, so reflecting telescopes use a mirror. The refractors have generally better image quality than the reflectors, but the refractors have a problem. If you don't have a high quality refractor, that refraction effect through this uh, objective lens can distort the image by causing the colors to come to a different focal point. So the blues focal point is one place, the red focal point is another, and it blurs out the image. Uh, so unless you get an expensive refractor, this can, uh, can be a problem. Uh, but get better quality images, a little simpler to set up a refracting telescope. The reflecting telescope does not have this color problem. All colors reflect at the same angle when they bounce. So the reds and the blues take the same path in the telescope and we don't have this problem of uh, separating the colors. This color separation problem is called chromatic aberration. Chromatic aberration, a color aberration. Uh, the reflecting telescopes have another huge advantage <clears throat> in that there can be bracing material behind the mirror and the mirrors can be made very large. I've uh, seen photos of mirrors 300 inches in diameter. Um, the largest refracting telescope is about 40 inches in diameter. <clears throat> the glass cannot be braced behind here or you block the starlight. And glass is not perfectly solid. It bends and for a very large refracting telescope as the tube points to different directions the glass bends in different ways and you lose the focus quality. Um, so refractors need a lens, need an expensive lens to uh, get a good quality image. Reflectors can be made more cheaply and can be made larger than the refracting telescopes. Here's a design called the Newtonian design and in this design the light comes in through an empty tube uh, all the way down the main mirror is at the bottom here for each one they're all Newtonian telescopes in this uh, in this photo so the main mirror is back behind the objective mirror down at the bottom the light then reflects up to a flat mirror that reflects the light out the side of the tube to an eyepiece again not hard to construct has a little disadvantage if you are height challenged. So here's the eyepiece up here and as you're moving across the sky to different objects this eyepiece can get to be at a considerable distance above the ground. So you may need a ladder to get up to the eyepiece. But the Newtonian telescope it is a reflecting type of telescope. Well, Galileo used his telescope to uh, make uh, very good observations of his universe when he sketched the moon, he found the moon had valleys and mountains, craters that were not smooth, uniform surface. Um, moving on to 1673, so that was 1609 for, for Galileo. Um, but uh, this particular telescope, the designs got kind of wild. Uh, 150 feet long, cables here, a pole, very unwieldy to move around, but had good color correction by this long focal length and uh, good magnification. We'll talk about that in another video, the magnification. Um, in uh, a telescope built in 1895 in Yerkes in uh, southern Wisconsin, I think, uh, never visited it, but it, 40 inch uh, diameter lens out at the end of the telescope out here gathering the light and then the light brought down to the eyepiece back at the, uh, just out of the, the photo. And a camera could be put here, photographic plate. Um, this photo is Einstein. So this is not a photo from 1895. This would be uh, late 20s, early third, 1930s would be my guess. But um, just the people here make it nice to see the scale of this telescope. And again, a little bit unwieldy in moving this around. Uh, you have to have a ladder sometime if you're looking at something low on the horizon. This eyepiece is going to be up off the floor quite a ways. Um, 
telescope design kept improving. In 1917, a main mirror 100 inches in diameter could be built and coated with silver. The process of uh, uh, making mirrors improved greatly around 1900. So mirrors uh, came into more use and large mirrors to gather light again to see dim objects. Uh, 1949, 200 inches in diameter. The main mirror is down here. Well, unfortunately, we don't have people to uh, to look at the uh, uh, viewing here. But you know, a person who is six feet tall is 72 inches tall. So this about three people, head to foot, could lay across this main mirror. And this main mirror, sometimes it was used to focus the light up here in a cage. <clears throat> and an observer actually would ride here and view the image or change out the photographic plates uh, but again at the prime focus instead of using an eyepiece just use the raw image to uh, to take your pictures uh, but that's about 1949 and aluminum um, deposited on the glass uh, was used to reflect the light there are plans for huge telescopes in the future and let's see if we can uh, kind of point out a few uh, telescopes here. So Hubble Space Telescope is 94 inches across for its uh, its diameter. So here the James Webb Telescope will replace the Hubble Telescope. I'm not sure if you know these projects tend to get delayed a little bit. Uh, maybe 2017 um, and it'll be a space telescope in orbit around the Earth. Um, the Keck Telescopes in Hawaii and you can see a little different design here, this honeycomb. Instead of just one large mirror, there are multiple mirrors that are coordinate their action to form one image, um, the, the, uh, the Keck telescope. And then plans for bigger telescopes, 30 meters, you know, over 30 yards across. Uh, 2022 is a plan. Um, <clears throat> perhaps the European Extremely Large Telescope in Chile, uh, 2022. Uh, again, with a segmented mirror, not one solid mirror, but uh, multiple mirrors that are that are cooperating to uh, uh, work together. Now, and here's the 200-inch telescope, uh, 1949, the largest telescope. There are some larger single mirror telescopes now, but uh, 200 inches, 1949. And again, astronomers want these big telescopes to gather more light, to see dimmer objects. That's the main purpose of a telescope, to gather light, to be able to see the dim objects, and gather the light and study the absorption spectra, the emission spectra, the continuous spectra, um, see just the physical details of uh, what's happening in a cloud of gas. Um, Hubble telescope, again, 94 inches for the uh, diameter of the main mirror. It is a reflecting telescope and put into orbit around 1990 but it had a problem here is on the left the first image that came back from the Hubble telescope a great disappointment because they expected the image over on the right and it turns out the manufacturing process for the mirror the uh, focal length of the main mirror was incorrectly uh, done it wasn't uh, the mirror was not shaped quite right not sh off by a lot, just I think the width of a human hair, the uh, curvature of the mirror was wrong, but it was enough wrong to make a fuzzy image. So consequently, that had to be repaired. The Hubble telescope's in a low Earth orbit that can be reached by astronauts. So there have been five missions to the Hubble telescope to upgrade its equipment and uh, put in sort of glasses to correct its vision, to get rid of the, uh, the fuzzy vision. And those have been extremely successful. Uh, the last one in 2009, and here's the uh, before and after the last servicing mission, it really improved the optics quality and the electronic detectors over the years uh, from 1990 till later on. No future plans to update the Hubble telescope, but it should uh, give us good image for a few more years. Hopefully, uh, won't uh, quit operating before the James Webb, te Webb, Webb telescope gets into operation. Now, our Earth atmosphere creates another problem other than just blocking certain wavelengths of light. The problem with our atmosphere is it makes things twinkle. You know, twinkle, twinkle, little star. Uh, 
as light goes through our atmosphere, our atmosphere is not perfectly smooth and not uniform density. And little pockets of air that are higher density or lower density act like lenses. And consequently, they bend the path of the light coming through our atmosphere and shift it around in uh, rapid motion. But this can be corrected with adaptive optics on the ground, adaptive optics. So we have a, without the adaptive optics over here on the right, and the same region of the sky with adaptive optics, now we can see separated objects. Um, the adaptive optics actually bend a small mirror in the light path in the telescope and compensate for the twinkling of uh, the atmosphere effect. So adaptive optics, very important. Um, the adaptive optics actually will allow Earth-based telescopes to produce um, more detailed image than the Hubble telescope. However, for just a very small region of the sky, the Hubble telescope can take detailed images over a larger area of the sky. So we're not replacing the Hubble telescope with these um, adaptive optics uh, devices, but they are uh, very good at uh, giving better images on the ground. Um, the small mirror is bent by uh, rapid computer-controlled motors and uh, corrects for the twinkling of the starlight. Um, here's another view of this, what happens on the left side. Same part of the sky as on the right side. No adaptive optics in operation here. Here, adaptive optics. So you can see these two bright stars, uh, the same in both diagrams and the one down here. Uh, but now with the adaptive optics, we can see much more detail on the sky. Then radio telescopes. Uh, started in the 1930s to uh, gather radio information from our universe. There are places in the universe where uh, the radio energy is uh, uh, more strong than the visible light energy. So astronomers want to learn uh, about objects using as many wavelengths as possible. So radio telescopes have been built to gather energy. So you know, 300 feet in diameter, radio signals are inherently very weak. If you remember the energy of the electromagnetic spectrum, the radio waves are the weakest. So you need a really big area to gather enough energy to be detectable. Uh, then moving it becomes a problem. This one is movable. Uh, but some radio telescopes are not movable. Here in Puerto Rico, the Arecibo telescope, 1,000 feet in diameter and built into some natural topography that was uh, uh, almost the right shape. So there's uh, metal down here that reflects the radio waves up to the receiver. So I hope that uh, gives you a little survey of uh, telescopes or reflecting telescopes. Use a mirror, refracting telescopes use a lens to gather the light. Um, we build telescopes to uh, gather light to see dimmer objects. That's an um, important quantity in, in, the, in the scheme. Uh, Galileo used the telescope very effectively to study the universe and uh, he publicized his, uh, um, his work. And we can compensate a little bit for twinkling with adaptive optics. With adaptive optics. So I'm going to quit there and uh, let you read and uh, just uh, ask questions.